of that <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, not not no bad association. So <laughs> yes. You ready? Okay. Yes. So I will formally start our panel. The title is Politics and the African Diaspora in Europe and the US, a comparative cross-Atlantic Europe-US conversation around, around Michael McCachrins. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michael McCachrins, Afro-Nordic Landscapes, published in 2014. So last time we spoke, Michael, about your book, I quoted um, a piece that Adam Gedachu published in the New York Times. Um, professor Gedachu is professor of political science at the University of Chicago and the author of World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination. This article published in July, 2020, titled Colonialism Made the Modern World, Let's Remake It. And to the topic of our discussion today, um, Professor Gedachu writes, colonialism lives on inside Europe's borders and Europe itself must be decolonized. Black Europeans experience discrimination in employment and education, are racially profiled and are subject to racist violence at the hands of the police and fellow citizens. The European Union recently avowed that Black Lives Matter, but its policies deprive Black people of equal rights, imprison them in camps, and drown them in the Mediterranean. Overseas imperialism was once believed to be a political necessity for European states. Today, anti-immigrant politics plays the same role. In either case, European policymakers disavow responsibility for the misery they bring about. Repair and redress is owed as much to Black Europeans as it is to former colonial states. It would mean treating Black Europeans and all migrants from the colonized world as equal participants in European society. And this form of reparation cannot be perceived as one-off transactions. Instead, it must be the basis of building an inclusive and egalitarian Europe. The struggle for racial equality in Europe is a fight for a truly post-colonial condition and its creation is implied by each dethroned statue. If colonialism made the modern world, decolonization cannot be complete until the world, including Europe, is remade. In that spirit, approximately six years ago, you brought together colleagues in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark to discuss equality and race in the Nordic countries. As you suggest in the book, Afro-Nordic Landscapes, Equality and Race in Northern Europe, published in 2014, one significant step towards a remaking of Europe and the remaking of the current world order requires Europeans and by extension, the international community to reckon with the Nordic countries, not as quote, race neutral and race equal human rights supporters, end quote, but rather as quote, racial states. So we will begin the discussion today um, and I will introduce our panelists, our participants in the round table. First, I will begin with Professor Pearl T. Robinson, winner of the African Studies Association's 2019 Distinguished Africanist Award for Lifetime Achievement in the field of African Studies. Dr. Pearl T. Robinson has authored more than 40 articles and book chapters on African and African-American politics. She is a past director of Tufts University's International Relations Program and has taught at Macquarie University in Uganda. Robinson served as president of the African Studies Association in 2006 to 2007. Her current projects include an intellectual biography of 1950 Nobel Peace Prize winner laureate Ralph Bunch and Mama Kowata, a documentary film about Islam and female empowerment in Nigeria. Robinson has a PhD from, in political science from Columbia University. Next is Professor Diane Pinderhughes, an eminent scholar of race, ethnicity, and politics, Dr. Diane Pinderhughes is University of Notre Dame faculty fellow and professor in the Department of Africana Studies and the Department of Political Science. Pinderhughes publications include Uneven Roads, an introduction to US racial and ethnic politics, co-authored 2014. Race and ethnicity in Chicago politics, a reexamination of pluralist theory, 1987. Black politics after the civil rights revolution, collected essays forthcoming. Pinder Hughes is a member of the National Advisory Committee of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholars in Health Policy Research Program. She was a member of and then vice chair of the Board of Governors of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Pinder Hughes has a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. Next is Dr. Michael McCachran, a prominent voice in Black European Studies and a seasoned international advocate for the human rights of people of African descent at the European Union and United Nations. Dr. Michael McCachran, McCachran is the editor of Afro-Nordic Landscapes, as we mentioned, published in 2014, and author of Universal Human Rights and the Coloniality of Race in Sweden, 2018. 
McCochran has a PhD in philosophy from Obo Academy, University of Finland. For, and then next, our last presenter, or not last, we're all in equal conversation in a round table, <laughs> is Jessica Lauren Elizabeth Taylor. Jessica Lauren Elizabeth Taylor hosted and moderated the Salon series Black in Berlin until 2017. Her film help is Muterende, Muterende. Pack. <laughs> a series that calls for femme forms of ancestral history has been screened in five countries. She is currently undergoing a Master of Arts in Black British Literature at Goldsmiths University of London and newly based in Oslo, Norway. And just for some context on myself, I'm founding executive director of the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences, which is an effort to center and amplify the work of global majority scholars in the social sciences across the global South and North. I'm an international historian of US philanthropy and the social sciences, and my book is forthcoming in October, title being White Philanthropy, Carney Corporations and American Dilemma and the Making of a White World Order. So let us begin with Michael. Uh, in this first section and conversation, the idea is to introduce Afro-Nordic landscapes and for each of the roundtable participants to connect their work to Afro-Nordic landscape and more of your recent um, scholarship. So go ahead, Michael. Thank you. And uh, yes, and thank you um, everyone for uh, being a part of this and uh, Yes, and I want to thank also uh, uh, Professor Tiffany uh, Willow B. Uh, Horad for making this happen and uh, uh, suggesting that we put together a, a panel like this for this uh, conference. Uh, very much appreciated. So, yes, uh, I can let me just begin by just maybe saying a few things about Afro Nordic landscapes, which was or is the first book in English on people of African descent in the Nordic uh, region. And the Nordic region then including the four Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and, and Finland, as well as Iceland. Um, and this book was very long in the making. Um, it took quite some years to, to uh, make it uh, happen. And when I submitted a uh, book proposal to Rutledge, this was uh, 2010, I had, uh, you know, tried for like maybe two years to get together a sufficient amount of uh, authors that uh, could make for book proposal. And but the end product was, I think it was maybe like 25% uh, uh, of the original authors were was uh, in the end product. So it was a struggle to put together this, uh, this book. And uh, I had to improvise also a little uh, with some of the chapters. So um, there are three chapters that are based on email conversations. And I think, you know, they turned out quite well. And uh, also, uh, you know, conceptually, I think also interesting uh, with their sort of, you know, uh, call and response um, um, uh, mode. But uh, they were put together uh, out of necessity. <laughs> uh, yes, so that's a, a, a little bit about the work, the, uh, the process that led to the book. Now the book um, challenges, of course, the view of the Nordic countries as racially homogenous. And um, the fact that maybe outside of the Nordic countries, there might still be a widespread view of uh, the Nordic region as uh, consisting of uh, uh, white, blonde, blue-eyed uh, people, uh, uh, maybe almost exclusively. Uh, however, Sweden in particular uh, has, is, is today quite a, a quite diverse country. And according to my own calculations a couple of weeks ago, um, there's about 15 to 20 percent of the Swedish population today are people of color. Um, and people of African descent make up 
approximately 2% of the Swedish population. Of course, that is much less than say in the US with 13%. But if you compare to the UK, for instance, which I think has 3.5%, you know, is still, is still a substantial uh, presence. Um, and yes, so that is one aspect, I think the one, one way in which the book was an in intervention. And then also it, it challenges the view of the Nordic countries as egalitarian moral superpowers as it were, that are progressively anti-racist in solidarity with the wretched of the earth, so to speak, anti-colonial, uh, and that they are not implied in any way by the colonial histories of European uh, countries. Then a third way in which I think the book uh, is an intervention is also, of course, and not least in how we should situate people of African descent in the Nordic countries. And what does situating them in the Nordic countries um, mean to how we view the uh, nationhoods, political ideals and communities of these countries. So it asks questions around nationhood, racism and diaspora in these countries, which also turns out to be the three thematic sections of, of the book. Uh, my my later work, and uh, you know, um, this might you know is a, a, a bit of an aside, but but uh, uh, you know I'm I'm, uh, I'm not full time a uh, full time academic, so you know I do a lot of civil society uh, work, so I don't have as much time for research as I would uh, uh, like to, uh, and but what I have the work that I've done in the area of Black European studies. I've also done some work in recent years in the philosophy of psychology, which was the uh, topic of my PhD dissertation. Uh, but in Black European studies, what I've done more recently is elaborated on how to situate a burgeoning African Swedish studies in Sweden, how to situate an African diaspora in Sweden, how to situate African diaspora studies in Europe and the relevance of Pan-Africanism to African diasporas in, in Europe. Thank you. Professor Robinson, would you like to follow up? Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank whoever it was, and I'm sure it's more than one person, was responsible for putting this together. And I'd like to salute you for the Afro-Nordic landscape book, which I would not have read if I hadn't been invited uh, to be on this panel because somehow I missed it. Uh, I think that comparative Pan-African studies is very important. It's something we need to do more of. And I think we need to do it in dialogical uh, fora as well. You need to do your, it's important to do your individual research, but one of the things that I have come to understand is that when we write and we try to talk about these things, we use categories. Even uh, listening to the piece that uh, the brilliant Adam Getachew wrote, she uses categories because we now tend to think about these things in categories. And I challenge your categories and we need to, but the thing is when you sit down and talk to each other, you find that, or, and listen to each other. That's the thing we don't do enough of. You find that um, Nelson Mandela and Randall Robinson big partners in the anti-apartheid anti struggle, when they use the term racism, conceptually, they don't understand it to be the same thing. They think they are talking about the same thing, but when they interact in a context in which their respective um, work products, the, the societies they're trying to create come into full focus, you find that 
what Randall thought of as the uh, black Southern racism he grew up with as a child and then lived as an adult in all parts of the United States was not exactly the same racism that Mandela had in his head. The black white thing is there. Um, the separation, the images, the scorn, the abuse, the um, exploitation, but the lived experiences don't necessarily enable you to communicate and to partner going forward uh, to the next phase. And I uh, actually tried to, I spent a lot of time struggling with how to put this into words in the chapter that I wrote in a new book that was edit, edited by Adike Adibajo called Pan-African Pantheon. Um, Ade is a former student of mine and he insisted I had to write about Trans-Africa. And because I have been an activist in Trans-Africa since its exception and was both um, former president and what are you, in charge of political education for our Boston chapter and on the national board, I kind of watched all the phases from the beginning to the triumph to its demise. And it's very painful for me and I did not want to talk about it. <laughs> and I just said, well, I'm doing this book on Pan-African Pantheon and Randall Robinson needs to be in the Pan-African Pantheon and you must write about it. And as I tried to figure out why the whole process was so painful to me. It came down to my realization that Randall who spent a year, he went to Africa doing research in Tanzania, uh, supposedly on the legal system, the Africanization of the legal system uh, following decolonization. But we really did, there, there was research and learning and getting to personally know uh, the, the leaders of the Southern African freedom uh, liberation fighters. He came to understand uh, what they were fighting for, why their fight had to be an armed struggle, and probably one of the most articulate defenders and, uh, of what they were doing and explaining it to it and bringing it back to the United States. But when he left Tanzania to return to the United States, he actually admitted in an autobiography that he never felt at home in Tanzania. He understood and totally was in sync with the political struggle, but he felt culturally alien. And he said primarily because he could not understand Julius Nereide's acceptance of uh, the colonial racism. And he felt the acceptance was if anybody has spent time in, in uh, East or Southern Africa where you have people from South Asia, they really treat black people like shit. I mean, that was my personal experience in a lot of situations. And that made it Randall very angry. Similarly, after Mandela got out of prison and he is putting together a nation, Randall was, he could not understand why Mandela got upset that Philadelphia wanted to give him a freedom award and that he had to share it with um, the clerk. And black Americans were very angry. They protested, they went to Philadelphia and protested when Mandela came with the clerk and accepted this award and um, he didn't understand. And when the press asked Mandela what do you have to say about these black Americans who are protesting? Mandela said, that's a domestic issue. I'm not gonna get involved. And I'm looking at <laughs> Diane, you know how that hurt. <laughs> you know how that hurt. So uh, I, think, I think I found some words to at least put that on the agenda of what needs to happen with Pan-African dialogues. We have the categories and intellectually, they make sense when you sit in your offices and people read your books and your students uh, get A's on their exams. But for me, Pan-Africanism, there are two, two people who I think really kind of uh, influence 
the way in which I see this. One is Bobby Hill, uh, the Garvey scholar. And maybe 30 years ago, I went to a conference that he convened at UCLA and he gave the opening uh, statement in his very you know, relaxed but erudite way. And he began by saying, Pan-Africanism is work that um, it, the categories are there, the people are there, but for Pan-Africanism to be real, you have to work at it and you have to work with each other. And part of that work is understanding the local context, the global context, the ways in which it oppresses and the ways that you can mutually liberate each other. And that can only happen through dialogue. The second person who has influenced the way in which I do the work of Pan-Africanism was my professor, Charles Hamilton. Uh, and at Columbia, Hamilton, for many of you probably know that he wrote or co-wrote the book, Black Power with Stokely Carmichael. And he taught Black Power at Columbia. That was one of the reasons I went to Columbia University. And one day, Hamilton, I mean, his teaching is very performative. He sort of gets in and he really captivates you. And he came in class one day and he wrote the word diaspora on the board. And he said, anybody who is serious about black power needs to know this word, make sure you know how to spell it and pronounce it, and then think about how you do it. And he said to me, Pearl, when you're thinking about doing diaspora, you need to think about the opposite number syndrome. I said, what does that mean? What does that mean, Professor Allen? Well, once you, you know, once you finish school, you're gonna go out and do things. And you may think I'm gonna do things in and with Africa. The most effective way to do it is to identify your opposite number in another part of the world. Don't just say, I'm gonna go and work on the issue of refugees. Uh, or, or I'm gonna go and teach people, or I'm gonna raise money for an issue. Identify your opposite number. Somebody who is in a situation where professionally or in terms of their civic activism, they're engaged in the same kind of work you are doing and figure out how you can work with them. You are in a position to bring certain types of resources to other, uh, other areas and fields of struggle uh, where those resources are needed. The people in those areas, particularly those people with similar backgrounds to your own, will know the local context. They will have probably thought strategically about what kinds of resources are needed and where they should be deployed. And the combination of working with people like that, the results, what you can do is so much more than if you're just thinking in terms of racial categories or uh, what Du Bois said in a certain article. And I internalize those two things so that uh, everything I do and increasingly the things I write, I try to bring those things together. And I, know, I, I would not have believed it if even 10 years ago, somebody told me I would make a movie. But that was my last big uh, Pan-African project and interestingly, it was the first time I personally, when I was in the field doing the project, felt what I call a Pan-African moment. It came from being in the field, doing work with people and the larger uh, group of people who were around cheered me. And it was this movie that I did, it's titled Mama Chota. It's a documentary about a a Sufi Muslim women's movement and its charismatic female leader and her work in the interest of female empowerment through Islam. And it's done in Hausa, it's done, done in the most widely spoken West African language so that her message can be spread across a large swath of Muslim women and men and communities. And I worked with an award-winning Nigerian filmmaker who won at least 26 international prizes, uh, the uh, Cannes Film Festival, French Legion of Honor. And two years ago, his, he won an award in filmmaking that the Harvard uh, uh, 
movie archives gate. Again, nothing I would have ever thought of myself doing. And I've done public screenings, outdoor screenings of the movie, and then I do an open mic. And just listening to people say what they gain from this movie, again, and I will finish, the most moving experience for me, you probably know that slavery still, forms of slavery still exist in Africa. And there is an anti-slavery movement that is identifying these women and help, helping to liberate them and legislation is being passed to now make the practice of slavery uh, a crime in parts of Africa where slavery was eliminated, but the practice was not a crime. And so I decided that I wanted to invite some women who had been recently liberated from slavery to view this film. And I managed to get 15 of them uh, to attend uh, a screening. And when, I pet, when we did the open mic, three of these women were the first to stand up. And the first woman said in this very strong voice, I want Mama Chota, who organizes these women's groups, I want to learn how to read. I'm tired of being poor. I want my children to read and to be respected. Tears went down my eyes. Uh, and I thought to myself, so this is what it's about. This is the work of doing diaspora. And it only happens if we figure out ways to do comparative, um, so comparative work on Pan-Africanism, diaspora studies, friends of liberation uh, in ways in which we can work with our opposite numbers and they know who needs to know the transformative messages. Thank you. Professor Penderhughes, would you like to follow up? Thank you, thank you, Pearl. That that was that was fascinating, and actually, I've been um, figuring out what I'm going to talk about by listening to you, um, but also to talk about my the people that I've come to know who work in this area. So, you know, I started with my research in um, uh, racial and ethnic politics in the U.S. Grew up in Washington D.C. Uh, native of Washington, my mother was, her mother was, um, and um, <clears throat> when I went to graduate school at Chicago, I looked around and thought, why are, you know, there are all these black people, they can vote, we couldn't vote in Washington. Um, so I began to do my research on, on Chicago and compared African Americans with um, um, Italians, and Poles because they were comparable groups in the early 20th century. Um, and great, my grad student Andre is now in here. Um, then um, I began to broaden that work after I finished the dissertation and, and it took me a decade to publish the book um, and then began to work on uh, voting rights politics um, in at the same time as the, um, I wanted to, actually, I began to work on looking at national policy. It turned out that the civil rights groups were working on voting rights at that point, it was the early 1980s. And um, so I followed that group. Meanwhile, um, NCOPES is operating and I have been involved with NCOPES for uh, many years. Um, and, um, NCOPES became a site for working in multiracial, pardon me, in uh, international politics, but a, a, a Brazilian South American group gradually formed, um, led by a number of people. Ali Johnson is involved, um, our program co-chair, um, uh, David Coven and, and Casey Morrison, and Casey works in Africa as well, in West Africa. Uh, and so um, I had always been interested in Brazil and the size of the, popul the black population there and trying to understand it didn't, you know, I wasn't a person who did field work outside of the US and still don't, but I can travel for conferences. 
Um, but the but NCOPS facilitated the um, uh, creating the Race and Democracy in the Americas project. And as you talked about um, the um, what Charles Hamilton taught you about your opposite number syndrome, um, it was through that project that I met my, you know, it's ambitious of me to say this, opposite number, namely Louisa Byros, who, who actually came to NCOPES. Um, she was a grad student at, at Michigan State in sociology and uh, in the um, 1990s, she began coming to NCOPES. Uh, and I think the time when we, she'd come more than once and we were talking about, we all wanted to be on the beach in Bahia. Uh, she, uh, that was about, that was in, um, in Virginia in, um, uh, uh, in the late 1990s. And we eventually did get the funds from uh, Margaret Wilkerson at, at the Ford Foundation to, to do the project. Um, and we, we met with, she introduced us, she introduced really KC and uh, David to a network of social activists, political activists who were academics, but were also running non-governmental organizations in Salvador and not all political scientists, but social scientists. And so the conference was organized around that network of people and it was remarkable absolutely wonderful introduction to the kinds of issues that they had, the personnel, the personalities. Unfortunately, Louisa, Louisa has passed away in 2018. Um, I invited her to be the, a plenary speaker at the International Political Science Association meetings, which we were having uh, that year as program co-chair that, um, and we weren't able to meet in the city we wanted to, which was Istanbul, Turkey because of the um, problems that the, was happening with Erdogan. And it turned out we were absolutely right not to go there. We went to Poland instead, but we would have been um, in the midst of the failed coup if we had gone, which we couldn't have had the conference, but we chose not to. But Louisa could not come. She passed away shortly before the conference, but she was our, she was our opposite number for the NCOPES activists who were interested in interacting with um, scholars in Brazil and to provide a intellectual framework for Afro-Brazilian scholars who, you know, were very bright but didn't have academics with whom they could work in their universities because there weren't very many black academics who were on faculty. So we've helped create a generation of those individuals. Some of them are, um, some of them are, are scholars. Uh, uh, a, a group came to the night 20, 19 NCOPES, is that right, 20, 29, uh, 2019? No, they came to the 2019 NCOPES, excuse me. Um, and they're still working with KC and um, Daniel Cleveland and, and others. So that network has been forged and is really quite, um, quite active actually. Um, some others, and this goes to the European um, side. I began to travel more in Europe as I've gotten a little older, um, mostly for conferences. But when I got to a certain age recently, I realized I don't have to go to a conference to travel. <laughs> <laughs> it took a long, I'm a slow learner, very slow learner. Um, so some examples of people whose work um, sits right in the midst of the work that you're doing, um, Professor Gakrin. Um Jean Beeman, I don't know if you know her work. She's based at UC Santa Barbara. Her work is on citizen outsider, children of North African immigrants in France. She was a PhD student at Northwestern. She had a postdoc here at uh, Notre Dame, at, pardon me, a dissertation fellowship at Notre Dame. And she continues that work and is, is very active. Um, Kira Thurman, who's um, had another, another dissertation fellow here at Notre Dame whose work, I see you know, she works on Afro-Germans, uh, particularly musicians. Um, I, Paula Pearl, I don't know if you saw the um, documentary recently about Marian Anderson. Uh, it was a one, incredible, it was about two weeks ago, it was on PBS. And so Kira is, is in that significantly. Um, 
talking about uh, Anderson's travels in Europe. Uh, and Cure is at the, at the University of Michigan. Um, and then the other connection, um, I, I grew up in Washington, DC. I mentioned that, went to a um, high school. One of the black students in the class with me was a, is a woman who's an artist named Rochelle Purrier, who's based in um, Stockholm in Sweden. She went to grad Sorry, what's her name? Hmm? What's her name again, sorry? Rochelle Purrier. Hmm. He's, and she taught for many years at the Royal Swedish Academy. Um, hmm. Her husband's father taught at University of, at Indiana University where um, she was in grad school while I was in grad school at, at Chicago, but I didn't know that she was those, you know, pre-email, pre, -email, pre um, everything that we can use to communicate with now. Uh, and so they eventually married and she went to try work in, in Sweden and she recognized she could teach, she could work, she could do her, her artistic work and make a living in a way that it would be more difficult to do so in, uh, in the US. She's an African-American. Her brother is an artist. Um, um, the, uh, famous sculptor, uh, Martin Perrier. Hmm. Um, so because of her and because of my international travels for the for IPSA, I went to Sweden, to Stockholm for the first time and I've been back to see her since then. Um, you know, I, I'll, be, I'll be going back when um, <laughs> the uh, end of- Just the, two minutes the, if you- Oh, thank you, thank you. So I've, I've moved from my focus on life among African Americans in the US in Washington, looking at Chicago, comparing their lives and their politics with African, with um, European Americans uh, in terms of how they began to influence Chicago politics, looked at the international, looked at the national environment um, in terms of voting rights. And I I've never been able to finish that work because the voting rights work just is constantly under threat as we've seen even now, it's once again, and then began to look more broadly. Uh, I've been fascinated by the work of the younger scholars like Kira and Jean in looking at um, African communities in Europe and France and in, in Germany and so forth. So um, I've, I've, I've not, I've traveled in, in Britain and the UK, but, uh, and in Wales actually, uh, Glenn, Glenn Jordan uh, is a scholar who was a grad student at Illinois, who's now based in, um, in um, Cardiff uh, and went there to read his dissertation. Never finished the dissertation, but is still uh, Wales. So it's been fascinating to see these different spaces. Um, and, and as, as uh, Pearl talked about, the challenges of putting them together and understanding how each group sees itself is important. I did have a chance to look at your um, your paper that you suggested we look at as a basic uh, entrance into participating. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that discussion of diasporas and the different types and characteristics of diasporas. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pender Hughes. So um, Jessica, do you go, Jessica, I didn't ask you, but do you go by your full name, Jessica Lauren Elizabeth? No, it's just Jessica. Okay, Jessica, go ahead. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to Maribel for the invitation to be a part of this panel. I'm really excited to exchange and um, yeah, I'm honored to participate in this, this year's conference um, and especially on the topic of Afro Nordic landscapes. Um, thank you so much, Michael, for your book. And of course, Professor Robinson and Professor Pinder Hughes. Um, I'm an artist, filmmaker, and community organizer. My, my work is at the intersection of art, academia, and community research. Um, I just moved to Oslo about six months ago. I've been based in Berlin for the past 11 years, originally from the US. And um, I was just meditating on what Professor Robinson said um, about uh, or quoted Pan-Africanism as work. It made me think about um, 
the phrase decolonize is a verb. And I was thinking about that in relation to my work in relation to um, a series that I curated a couple of years ago um, called Black in Berlin. Um, it was a monthly discursive salon that explored literary, anecdotal, and statistical research on race relations and race politics within an art context. So the salon was a moving dialogue that was hosted in a different venue each month, ranging from museums to bookstores to theater spaces. And it started as a way to combat the deeply polarizing effects that's being seen as the other in German society when I first moved to Berlin in 2009. And it was started almost selfishly um, as a way for me to share experiences with other people from the African diaspora. As an American, I am easily accustomed to talking about race politics. And I quickly came to learn that the same is not true for Afro-Germans and a lot of other Afropeans. Um, race politics is sadly not a part of the, the popular lexicon. In fact, the word racism wasn't added to the German dictionary until 1997. So this speaks volumes to the work, I know, <laughs> that still needs to, because the word uh, racism, the word race, uh, rasa, was um, in reference to the word rasa, which was the word that Hitler used to talk about his supreme race. So they never wanted to use that word. And that's that influences a lot of things there, like why they don't take statistics and everything because of the whole history of counting. Um, which could be, they see as problematic. Um, so it speaks volume to the work that need, still needs to be done to unpack decades of being excluded from German society. And discussions in the salon were much more than I ever could have expected. Growing up in Florida, um, of course, I was used to seeing um, lots of different kinds of Black people, but I hadn't really experienced this vast amount of, of, of multiplicity um, of, you know, Afropeans from all over. And uh, one of the most crucial points I learned from facilitating the salon is that many um, Black Indigenous people don't feel comfortable in art institutions. Oftentimes the salons would take place within these spaces because these were the spaces accessible to me as an artist and these are the spaces that hosted me. And a lot of times um, the people I invited, they didn't want to come to the salon because they felt that these were places that had been unwelcoming to them or threatening or violent security guards who followed them and so on, or they felt like they weren't represented by the spaces. There were no artists who looked like them or no um, yeah, art on the walls um, that represented them. So um, in the past two years, I have noticed a shift to showcase these underrepresented communities in, in art institutions, but it's more of a tokenism. And it brings me to question um, what happens when the trend um, is finished, what happens when the tide turns. Um, so I thought about um, kind of decolonizing as a um, as an imposter. You said your book was an intervention. I thought about the salon also being an intervention into these spaces. Um, and it took me a while, several, probably a full year of doing the salon to realize that um, it was actually being used by the institutions to put on their programming as look, we have this diverse program, but you know, of course I was doing all the labor. So that's one aspect of my, of my work. Um, and then uh, another aspect is creating an archive um, for black indigenous people, specifically LGBTQIA folks. Um, mainly centered around the cultural sector. In 2017, I made a film um, entitled Muta'eda. Uh, Muta'eda literally translates to Mother Earth, but the word itself means topsoil, like the, the, the part of the dirt that is the riches. Um, and it is a collection of interviews with Black femmes from various parts of the diaspora on their matriarchal lineages. 
as a Black American, um, as we all know, the histories of uh, my ancestors have been systematically erased, deleted, and destroyed. And we know that by destroying someone's history, you can almost effectively expunge their legacy and render them powerless. So archiving is a privilege not often afforded to um, marginalized peoples. And oral history is often not present due to shame and trauma. So one of the jumping off points for creating this film was a conversation that I was replaying um, in my head that I used to have with my mother. I would ask her about um, my grandmother, um, her mother. And I would ask her, you know, what was she like and what were her interests because I never met her. And um, my mother said that she used to ask the same question to her mother about her grandmother because she also never met her grandmother. And she would ask her, you know, what were her hobbies? And my grandmother would say, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. And I thought that really speaks volumes to kind of the shame and the trauma and the silence. And so I was very curious if this lack of knowledge, um, specifically on matriarchal lineages, is true for femmes across the African diaspora. So I invited five femmes. Um, four of them, three of them being female identified, one being non-binary, one being trans, from Gabon, Argentina, Dominican Republic, um, the US and California and Benin to share their knowledge or lack of knowledge of their mothers, mothers, mothers. And it created an archive of mothers, of artists, of black femmes um, where one hadn't previously existed. And I, um, I did not expect all of the stories to be so closely linked, to have this, the same, um, um, yeah, uh, to, to have so many similarities. And that's what the film was, was born out of. Um, so having recently relocated to Norway, I still see these similarities and differences of being black in Europe. And it makes me um, interested in exploring the liminal spaces of blackness, what is um, in between the spaces. So yes, I think that may be my time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. Wow. Right? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so you know what, I actually, we're going to follow the script, but I thought maybe um, if you had questions for each other, maybe it'd be a good time to pose them. Uh, what do we do? We raise our hand. So Jessica, uh, are, are these films available to be seen by yeah. people like me? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay, yeah. well, we'll get the, we'll circulate the information. Um, I, your phrase, I did not expect all of these stories to be so closely linked in a sense is the categories emerged from people telling their stories. And I just love to have a dialogue where you have two things. We start with the categories and we do the research. We start with the stories and the categories uh, come out of the telling of the stories. I see that it's just such an important research methodology to introduce into this space that we're talking about. And um, of course, Diane, I haven't been a Diane groupie because I keep going to Africa and I've got all these places with you. But the way in which your career, I really do think of you as somebody who's a specialist in American politics, the way in which your career uh, has been so cosmopolitan around the Americanness of your studies and then branching out, I think is also a way of seeing uh, these sort of Afro diasporas in mm -hmm. a context that people might not normally think about them. It, and I was interested in, you know, I'd been reading about, interested in Brazil and NCOPES kind of created this opportunity that we, we may happen. Uh, and it's still, it's still alive. I mean, I had a conference here uh, in Notre Dame, I mean, in 2019 of the NCOPES, it was the second generation of the Race and Democracy in the Americas project. So people came again and um, began to talk again. Uh, and they're working on a, um, a new volume actually at this, at this moment, they've started a request for a call for proposals, but you know, with the Texas um, 
developments and just recently I, I expect that Danielle Cleland will be a little bit slowed down by the schedule that they had initially proposed. Um, well, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see people in all these different locations. It's, and, you know, you go to conferences and, and then you begin to see um, those spaces. And I intend to go visit people. I mean, that's one thing. And I stay in contact. And of course, with email and, and now Facebook, it makes it much easier to do than was possible. Um, you could do it, but it was, you really had to write letters, <laughs> have a long, uh, long exchange, et cetera. Thank you. I was oh, going to combine, I was like, Jessica, go ahead. I just, I, I had a, a maybe boring <laughs> question for Michael, but just um, about, <laughs> um, about writing the book. And, and funding and, and public interest and publishing um, and that process and how difficult or easy it was and, and pushback and all in the media, just because since having moved to the Nordics, I noticed that there is a real um, um, push towards this Scandinavian exceptionalism. Just, you know, we're outside of, um, we're outside of any kind of conversation on race and we're not part of any colonial undertaking. And, and so I was just wondering how your book was received and brought to life. Yes, so yes, thank you for that uh, question. I think maybe, um, yes, there's a lot of things to be uh, uh, said about, uh, about, about this. And uh, I'll also be interested to hear more about uh, your experiences in, in Norway and Berlin too. We might have some friends in common in Berlin, maybe, who knows? <laughs> uh, I have some, some friends and colleagues in, in, in Berlin. And by the way, uh, Gene Beeman, I know very well who that is. And uh, we are supposed to embark on a joint project setting up a uh, a video podcast about on Black Europeans, myself, Jean, Jean Beeman, and, and, and two others. And uh, Kira Thurman, I also know, uh, I uh, invited her to be one of the 10 Black Studies experts to be involved in uh, commenting on uh, and feeding into a process that led up to the U first report in the European or the first European Union report on people of African descent in, in Europe called Being Black in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> so, yes, anyway, the, uh, uh, the reception of uh, Afro-Nordic landscapes in, in, uh, in Sweden and the Nordic uh, region has been, uh, you know, lukewarm at most. Uh, there, there were some reviews in in the Swedish press 2014. So, uh, Dagens Nyheter, which is the largest morning paper in Sweden, it reviewed the book. But uh, you know, I think that was, or not, I know. I mean, I know is mostly because I sort of prompted the reviewer to do to write a review. No, uh, no, impersonally. Then there was a review in uh, um, the local regional paper in this part of the country, uh, Sveitsvenskan, the largest morning paper in this part of the country. Um, and then there was one review in a political magazine by uh, a prominent Afro, young Afro-Swedish um, intellectual, a woman, um, uh, Backstrom is her last name. And uh, so there was, there has been, there were some reviews, but uh, yes, reception was lukewarm. Um, it has not been widely discussed or anything like this. It's been uh, quite anonymous, actually. Um, and I think maybe also partly because I haven't been, um, you know, I was not in, in academia at all when the book was published. And then in recent years, I've, you know, only been part-time in, in, in academia. So that might have something to do with it. But also speaking to your Nordic exceptionalism, uh, you know, um, race, race does not exist. 
barely exists in the Nordic uh, countries. It's not something that is spoken of. Um, race as a term, as I write about in Afro-Nordic landscapes also, um, has been uh, expunged from, from anti-discrimination legislation um, in Sweden, for instance, since 2009. Yes, colonial legacies, race, these sorts of things are almost never spoken uh, of. And when they are spoken of, they are spoken of in, in, in euphemistic terms, such as immigrants, uh, you know, rather than speaking of, say, racial segregation, which is a real issue in, in all the Nordic countries. Um, they speak of, uh, you know, just segregation or maybe ethnic seg segregation. And they talk about ethnic discrimination when talking about discrimination against people of African descent. Although, uh, of course, you know, um, you can't describe that in terms of, it doesn't even make sense to describe it in terms of ethnic discrimination. You know, if you, I, I think you, I think most Swedes won't be able to name two ethnic groups in Africa. So uh, is that that's not the way to conceptualize it. But they keep speaking in terms of these euphemisms if they at all speak about racism. So this is pretty much the situation in the Nordic uh, countries. And of course, there's no space for black studies or and there's no space in academia for people like myself, really. Uh, you know, Swedish academia is very white. Uh, you would have, you know, I'm among the people who, uh, um, who introduced post-colonial studies to Sweden, um, yet, you know, and you have all these white professors these days in post-colonial studies and so forth. Um, and, but, you know, someone like myself wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be given a foothold anyway. So white people speaking to white people about, yeah, <laughs> uh, things that are not all that relevant to Sweden either most of the times. So, so uh, this is this is pretty much the situation and, and and the reception of the book. And I can attest to that. We actually met Michael and I. I was living in Sweden last year, um, and I've been going to Sweden for a decade. And um, it very much resonates. I was like trying to dig through to see where global majority scholars existed in Sweden. Um, so it was teasing through. Um, and to your, I actually wanted to add to. Um, uh, Professor Robinson and Pinder Hughes and also Jessica, your comments about uh, just how Pan-Africanism works. Like, I just wanted to honor the people who brought us together because it is these very human connections of, you know, Michael and I meeting in a very uh, Swedish context and then Edna Bonom putting myself and Jessica together and Tiffany getting us together with Professors Robinson and Pinder Hughes. And this is how these networks um, internationally um, connect us. Uh, so just to honor these individuals. Um, I, I thought of maybe, go ahead. One thing. Michael needs some opposite numbers. <laughs> and so let's see, let's see if we can identify some and get some of those connections together. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, I'm Hashim Jabril. And I would just like, I've been listening to the conversation and I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, uh, I've lived in various parts of uh, Pan-Africa. Uh, I, I came into the world in the United Kingdom. Uh, my parents are from Sierra Leone. I lived in Nigeria. And now I live in the United States of America. So I see myself as a child of Pan-Africa. I remember when I was, I, when I was in Ghana, uh, in those uh, forts where they kept captive Africans as part of that human trafficking. Uh, and it said, uh, at one time, this fort, Cape Coast was owned by the Swedes. And so I don't know if there, is there no dialogue in Sweden about that? I know, of course, in the UK, of course, they've been now uh, being asked to revisit and reckon again, yet again, uh, their role in uh, the trade in captive Africans and also, uh, of course, colonialism and that. And so this time of kind of colonial reckoning, reckoning for uh, uh, the exploitation of African peoples around the world is, is, is an important time. And so I know the Belgians try and deny their role and the French uh, uh, and uh, that there must be a, a realization on their part that 
they have a history of involvement uh, in such a, you know, kind of crimes against humanity. And so that's just a, 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 a question. I don't know if uh, it resonates with anybody uh, in the Swedish Academy, I'm sure, but it resonates with you, I'm sure. And, and so uh, I would just like your uh, reflections on that, please. Yes, thank you. So look, yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. And, and Michael, I just wanted to flag uh, yep, yep, yep. to, do you hear me? Just yep. that we have uh, Professor Pinder Hughes and then also Professor Zaki in the notes. And we only have about uh, 11 minutes or less uh, uh, left. So I just wanted to flag. Okay, maybe um, take the two other questions also. Okay, so um, Professor Pinder Hughes, if you can go um, and ask your question, and I'll just read out Professor Zaki's in the notes. She had two. Um, to Professor Robinson, can using an intersectional framework serve to explain or anticipate different lived experiences in the African diaspora? And for you, uh, Michael, has Denmark done anything substantive regarding reparations in the U.S. Virgin Islands? Um, so we have less than 10 minutes. I want to make sure we have those questions. And then Professor Pinder Hughes, I don't know if this is a moment you would want to speak. I just really wanted to intervene it to introduce Andrea Pena Vasquez, whose dissertation work is on um, African migrants in, um, in Spain and reading the uh, McEachern um, paper last night in which he talked about different parts of the ways in which diaspora is conceptualized around Europe. He did mention Spain as one of those locations. And that's the conversation we actually haven't had in terms of your research. Um, we've talked about the diaspora in a, a, a readings uh, course we did before you went to the field, but I just wanted to put that on the table, so. Should I respond to uh, Zaki's? Yes, in, indeed, intersectional framework does work. And one of the things that I made note of is what's missing from the intersectional framework that we normally use is Muslim identity. Because I've spent most of my time actually working in parts of Africa, the population is more than 90% Muslim. What I note is the absence of the sort of Muslim scholars, people whose identity is Muslim or people working on that in a lot of the anthologies of um, about Pan-Africanism. And my two favorite missing books in that. So yes, intersectional framework and let us be keep our eyes open to understand all of the different uh, identities that one finds in Afro-diasporic populations. Muslim identity is a large one that we tend to leave out. Uh, so I just wanna underscore two books that people may or may not know. The scholar Usman Khan, who uh, presently holds the chair in Muslim Islamic studies at Harvard Divinity School. About 20 years ago, Usman did a short book for Codestria, Council of Social, Social Science Research in Africa, mm -hmm. titled Non-European African Intellectuals. And in 2003, it was enlarged into a full length book, Non-Europhone African Intellectuals. And much of at least what we read is done by Europhone African intellectuals, but there is in fact a literature among this other group that's missing from our conversations. And a few years ago, uh, Usman came out with this fantastic book uh, titled an intellectual history of Muslim West Africa, which I consider to be one of the most important books that's been written about Africa, at least in a decade. Uh, so that's what I think intersectionality, and let's open our eyes and see what are the missing identities uh, that are very, are quite prominent. And again, we can be, become stronger, and I'm now incorporating into my uh, vocabulary, uh, global majority scholars, thank you. Thank you. Michael, did you want to respond to the question? I interrupted your response. Okay, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll try to be short. So uh, uh, yes, Denmark and, and uh, Sweden. Denmark has not uh, uh, paid any sort of reparations. It doesn't 
really in any proper way uh, re recognize its responsibility for the uh, Virgin Islands today. And uh, as uh, I guess we all know, CARICOM, the Caribbean community of 50 member states are pursuing reparatory justice from European states, including Denmark and Sweden actually since 2013. Um, however, none of these two countries has at all been willing to uh, speak with CARICOM about these, this, this, uh, this issue, and uh, CARICOM has uh, sent uh, uh, letters to the heads of states in these two countries, but they have only been met with silence. So um, that's, that's pretty much the, the reparations uh, front in, in these countries. In terms of recognizing history, Sweden has only for say the past 10 years or so at all officially recognized that it has had any sort of involvement in the transatlantic uh, trade. Although as uh, Hashim you point out, there's a fort in, in what is today Ghana that is, uh, was built by, by, by Swedes and uh, uh, Swede, Sweden did have a, uh, an island uh, in the Caribbean for almost a hundred years, what today is Saint Bart, Saint Barthélemy, uh, that uh, yes was was uh, so to speak owned by by Sweden, uh, and that was a significant free port in the transatlantic trade and so forth. Swedish iron played a significant a huge role for uh, more than a hundred years in the transatlantic trade. And so many of the shackles, among other things, was was made by Swedish iron. And so, yeah, and you know, I could go on and on. But these sorts of connections have only been officially recognized for the last 10 years and or so, and only in on a small scale. And it is still not something that is a part of the public awareness, if you will, is not public knowledge, really, although the Swedish agency, the Forum for Living History, has for the past, say, five years, um, been, you know, doing, have had some uh, programs around Swedish involvement in the transatlantic trade. Wow. So, okay, we have two minutes left, and I thought we would just bring everyone back together in the round table with your final question, is Pan-Africanism alive and well? Does it have a future? Should it have a future? What sort of Pan-Africanism and why? So we can start with Professor Robinson, the same order we did before. Go ahead. We alive have- and, Alive and well, and let's sort of uh, jumpstart the next phase using things like Zoom and new technologies. But clearly what's come out of this discussion is lots and lots of buckets of history, of history connections uh, and forms of learning that I think uh, will infuse new life into the next phase of Pan-Africanism. Professor Pinder Hughes. I do think that, that it is, and I think the, um, the work that Jessica's doing in, the, in terms of the arts, but you know, the area that's outside of our focus, but it's music. Um, whether you talk about the U.S., South America, Europe, Africa, it, that is quite Pan-African. And I think the scholarly uh, work is coming along as well. So, yeah. Then Jessica and then Michael, you can conclude. Yeah, I just wanted to draw parallels when I think of movements like Black Lives Matter movement and just how that has totally upended the parts of Europe that I have been living in, in Berlin and Oslo. And I've seen some structural shifts um, and some legislative shifts um, towards, um, towards equity, which is um, a fight that I've been fighting for. Michael, your final words, closing this up. Oh, okay, yes. Help. Sorry. So yes, uh, thank you, uh, everyone. And yes, Pan-Africanism is, is definitely uh, alive and, and uh, well. And uh, me personally, I'm a Pan-African activist and breathe and live it on a daily basis.
<laughs> Thank so you. we really have to end now? I think they must curate it and cut it and edit, right? So they don't have these awkward moments at the end. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, it's been an honor. Thank you um, for letting me play this role here. And I hope we have many more conversations. I'm just looking forward to it. Thank you, Thank you yes, all so, so much. And Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. I'll email all of you. The a Notre Dame graduate. Maribel is a Notre Dame graduate. So much to talk about. So much. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Wonderful to meet you all. Bye. 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 Bye.